Now, you know, on the property here, we would probably average two to two and a half. The Australian average is less than that. Now, just imagine if we could even get it to 5%, right? Let alone 10%. Imagine the life productivity and resilience that you'd see in such a landscape. And that's that's the goal. That's the goal that, that we need to be aiming at collectively as, as you know, Australian farming community. That was Johannes Meyer, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders, and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer and in this podcast series I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host Charlie Arnott. G'day and welcome back to The Regenerative Journey. Uh, before I bang on about our wonderful guest for this week, I just want to mention a couple of quick things. Um, if you're indeed interested in buying some of our biodynamic lamb, it's a new uh, enterprise, a new breed of lamb we're using here at Hanami you know, It's called the Kelso. Uh, David Alexander over at Cootamundra uh, and his son Jim got us onto that. A um, couple of years ago, and it's beautiful lamb. Uh, the way you can get your hands and your mouths and plates and kitchens and pans and everything on that beautiful lamb of ours, it's via Integrity Meats. Now, Luke and Stu, two good buddies who farming over towards um, uh, Triagra and Crookwell, they have bought a butcher shop in Goulburn. They've called it Integrity Meats, and they're um, selling amazing uh, regeneratively grown products, duck, beef, lamb, our lamb, um, and many other yummy things, pork. So the guys over there are doing a wonderful job of um, getting that lamb of ours into homes. And they're also doing deliveries into in the sort of the Southern Tablelands and also into Sydney. So if you are all interested, get on to Integrity Meats and their website there. Put your order in. You can you can go to the shop, get this bits and pieces, or you can order online and get half and full lambs of ours all for your little self. Another thing I want to plug um, is our Your Regenerative Journey webinar series. It's kicking off on the 16th of August. There will be an ad somewhere in this episode about it, uh, but we have secured some amazing uh, guest speakers, and it's all about how you, even you know, if you're a uh, looking to farm or you've just started farming and you want to do it in a more natural way and in, in a regenerative way, this is the course to do. Uh, our seven speakers will guide you through different facets, different cornerstones of regenerative farming and, and not just farming but, but living. And it's all about, you know, it's about the philosophy and the attitude of what you are trying to do on your beautiful bit of land that you are stewarding at this time. And also for farmers and gardeners who are already sort of gardening and farming and doing their thing and just looking to maybe do things differently. And even those who are already on their regenerative journey who are just keen to learn a bit more, you know, get back to basics because we often can get very excited about jumping on board, changing things. As I always say, you know, the first place to First, play, the first paddock to change is the one between your ears and, and sometimes just getting back to basic, basics and, and, and sitting and thinking, especially visions and goals type stuff, um, you know, the, the basics of soil and, and, and what to look for and what to start digging around for and what to, what to investigate, the data to collect, um, health of animals, health of your finances, uh, health of your grass. It's all tied together in our webinar series. So if you're looking to sharpen your saw um, or sharpen your pencil, uh, with your skills and expertise and even just basic understanding of, of getting on the, uh, the more naturally farming bandwagon, then join us. Um, details will be at charliearnett.com.au and we can't wait to have you join us. It's going to be global because it's, um, it's, a, it's a virtual, uh, the modules are virtual once a week, starting on the 16th of August. Kicking off with Nicole Masters, actually, she's been got a very tight time, time frame 
and we're thrilled that she can um, squeeze this little session in for us and kick off the whole thing. Um, and then Katie Zerner will be the following week to talk about visions and goals and values. Uh, now, that all culminates on a, with a farm tour here at Hanamina on the 13th of October. Okay, so you can buy tickets that are just a webinar series if you're overseas and you know you can't get here or if you want to get a bit down and dirty, learn some more about biodynamics, natural seconds farming. Stuart Andrews is going to be here. Um, a number of our other guest speakers will be here as well to talk about their different different um, pillars and principles. Uh, then get yourself here on the 13th of, August, of, of, 13th of October and um, put it in your diary. Just block it out. Block out a bit of time before and after to get yourself here, and uh, we can't wait to see you. That's probably enough of the blurb about what we're going on about. Johannes Meyer, I met, oh, 2018, 2019 it might have been, at Danthonia. I went to one of their wonderful field days they put on there, and Christine Jones, Dr. Christine Jones spoke at that, and she is amazing. So lovely to get back there a few months ago to do a two-day introduction to biodynamics workshop with Hamish at Danthonia. The uh, Christian community there, which I just love the way that all works, is, you know, 150, 200 um, people in the community. Um, they school their children there. They've got lots of different enterprises. A lot of the food they eat comes from the farm, big vegetable garden, lots of meat. And and Johannes is uh, essentially um, one of the principals there of the, the agriculture and the animal um, uh, part of the business, part of the community. And what a lovely bloke. We did our two-day workshop and the end of the second day we snuck down to a to the dam, a little dam down there with a hut. And um, after some <laughs> – it rained on the tin roof. There's no power there, so we had to go back and get a generator. Then that one buggered up. And then we got another one, and I think that one stopped working. <laughs> so you'll probably notice – you were, well, maybe not. Reese is a bit of a magician with audio, so you may or may not notice somewhere in the middle of this – what he's been able to—we actually lost a bit of the um, audio um, uh, when when we were recording with um, when I was recording with Johannes um, when the generator stopped. We lost fifteen twenty minutes, but but what Reese has been able to do is pull out the audio from the video I did of the interview, and um, he spliced that in there. So that little trick of uh, a little test for you guys to see where he's actually done that. Um, that's enough for me. Really enjoyed my chat with uh, Johannes. Lovely guy and such a doing some amazing things there at Danthonia. Um, check them out, um, Google them and see what they are doing. Natural seconds farming, multi-species pasture cropping, um, lots of you know animal impact and r- rotational grazing and, um, and just a lovely, lovely community and lovely bloke. So I hope you enjoy this chat with Johannes Meyer as much as I did on the regenerative journey. Johannes, we are <coughs> we're here. After a bit of hoo ha, welcome to the regenerative journey, and welcome to uh, what do you call this beautiful little cabin we are sitting in at the moment? We call this the bush hut. The bush hut. Yeah, and thank you for having me on, and oh, pleasure. pleasure to be with you today. It's great. Might well, I can come forward a little? Let's right. Just sneak a little chair, another half a foot forward. <clears throat> that's it. We'll line it. That's better. See that mug of yours. Perfect. Um, the bush hut. Do you have to like get special permission to come down here? Or- <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great place to relax. It's uh, beautiful, special for me because this was the first place where um, we heard the reed warbler after the drought. Really? And you're I'm sure you know Charlie Massey's book, Call of the Reed Warbler. Yeah. Um, so you, you see, so this it's it's native to this area. Yep. And you and you heard. How did you know that was it? Did you go? That's an unusual. Actually, you had a twitcher come down and identify for me. Because you went. There's something. There's a noise down yeah, here. There's a bird. A bird here. We, so when was that? How long ago was that? It's about three years ago. Really? Two and a half. Did you get to see him? Did yeah. you see the? Yeah. yeah well, now they live in, in the reeds there. Wow. This beautiful, is beautiful. for those who ooh, hang on. What I'm going to do? I haven't plugged my little mic thing in there yet, have I? Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's that a crack. Um, for those who uh, I'm bit, always a bit nervous about moving the camera, actually I'll give it a quick little go, a little scan. We're sitting in a in the bush hut, which is a beautiful timber hut, right on the edge of a dam, and there's reeds there, kumbungi there, mm-hmm. or surrounding the little dam, and that's where the reed warblers are hanging out. That's fascinating. 
I don't know if I re- would recognise one if I saw one. Um, but as you alluded to, Charlie Massey called the Reed Warbler his um, his signature um, to most people. He's written a few other books, but signature work, which um, Hamish Mackay would say was the um, uh, the what did he say last night? Was the it's it was a sort of the pivotal pivotal, pivotal moment. Book, yeah, yeah. Mm. there was a moment where you know there was um, acknowledgement. There was the, the the highlighting of farmers and then the real um, getting it out to the world <clears throat> that regenerative farming, what it was and where it came from and why it was here. That would have been really exciting, going, I've got my own yeah, reed warbler. Fantastic, yeah, absolutely it was. And, you know, we'd been through the drought. Um, this whole valley had been, you know, dry. The stand was empty um, during the drought, right down to the bottom. mm and to see it rehydrated and the reeds back and the reed warbler to to come along, pretty cool. So were there any reeds here at all? They just got it, what? They would have been before the drought, but they were not, yeah, they would have been grazed, grazed down. Grazed down and smacked and, down. And, 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 just, and there yeah. wasn't much left after wow. that drought. You can hear some thunder <clears throat> right out there. We... Um, <laughs> We got down here a while ago. Um, it was raining. We there was no key. Well, we didn't. We didn't think we needed the key. It was raining, so we went. Let's go inside. Um, <laughs> you had us burned up. He'll get the got the key. <laughs> we got set up. Got the little electric jenny going, and then it wasn't going to be good. It didn't didn't fire or didn't wasn't quite going to do the thing. So <laughs> he's been up the hill a third time <laughs> to go and get the um, the other jenny, which you can't hear. It's up up the back there. That's fantastic. So I really appreciate the effort. Oh, but what a fantastic spot. Um, so looking out here, I mean, you've already alluded to sort of significance of, of this little hut and what has happened here and the somewhat of a discovery. What else, um, Johannes, is there that that is significant about what we're looking at? What does it conjure up? Is this is this somewhat a happy place for you? It is. If you think about uh, a property as a as an organism, which I do, right? And there's always a heart of an organism, and I think the heart rests in this valley. We're sort of at the top of the valley, but going down towards the creek. Um, there's there's just a lot of life. Uh, and a lot of water moving uh, on the surface and under the surface. And, um, yeah, it's just a special place on the property. And we're looking, obviously, we're in a bit of a riparian zone here. I mean, is it a good example of, I mean, I can see some trees on that little ridge. Mm -hmm. You guys planted that? Yeah. And then, obviously, the rehydration of this and what you're probably doing upstream a little bit. Um, you've got good ground cover. I mean, this is a wonderful little snapshot. Mm. But I mean, I, you know, I haven't been all over the place, but it looks a Danthony here. But what a what a what a wonderful example of what can be done. You know, yeah. do, do do you remember this twenty something years ago? Oh yeah. So the whole valley was um, well. Well, to back up, we bought the place in nineteen ninety nine. I actually only got here in two thousand and four. But the place was just grazed to the ground. There was almost no trees. Um, it was during the millennial drought, granted. Mm. So it was tough times. You know, sub sub-average rainfalls. But um, really a degraded landscape that, that even when rain came, it didn't really respond too well. If you can picture that. Oh, totally. So it's just, yeah. You know. A lot of people would look at that and go, oh, why would you want to buy that? Mm. What was the what was the attraction? Yeah, good good question. So, actually, um, our community sent, I think, three or four of our guys down to to have a look at what was available, and I think one of the government agencies put together a list of thirty properties. You know, maybe between Queensland and um, Brisbane and Sydney, sort of in, inland a little bit. Yeah, wow. and they went and looked at all those different properties and. They were somewhat taken when they saw the property the first time. But after they'd gone through the whole 30 um, and they circled up and said, you know, what are we thinking? Um, They came back to this one. And um, look, it was kind of a feel thing. Um, We could have been closer to the coast or it was greener, more trees. Uh, It could have been north or south. But they came here and they felt like 
you know, this is this is the right place to be. Um, so I can't really explain it better than that. But that that's what happened, and we um, purchased the place. And um, with the idea of having a forming community. Yeah. Yeah. When you say we, we're, we're talking about the Bruderhof yeah, Christian Bruderhof. community. Yep. Yeah. So it's an international Christian community movement, um, mainly based in the States, but we have representation in uh, England, Germany, Austria, um, Paraguay. Paraguay, yeah. Um, Korea. So yeah, we're Israel. So there's a few different places where we are. Um, this is the only one in Australia? The only community yeah, in Australia? This yeah, is the, this is the only community we, we have here currently. Can, and can I say, because we've just to put, what are those little ones that just, those birds that just went into that reeds, those reeds, about 20 of them just went, zip, little little things, tiny uh, things, went into those reeds over there. Yeah, they could be diamondbacks, uh, diamond firetails or something wow, like that. Wow, they just went, zip. Mm. Hid, hiding there. We just put things into context why I'm here. Hamish McKay and I have just done a two day introduction to the biodynamics workshop um, here at Danthania, and it was absolutely wonderful. We had a wonderful group of people. We had um, Norman, is in, I think he said he's nearly 80, yeah. just over 80, maybe. What a, what a lovely bloke. No, that's great. <laughs> when I was saying about his complexion, he was like, hey, that guy has seriously good skin, doesn't uh, he? Uh, um, must be the biodynamics he's been doing for 30 mm. years. <clears throat> and then we had um, uh, Jeffrey uh, McCosker, who I think is 18 or so, 17. Mm. I mean, it was a lovely group, you know, array of people, a diverse group of people, um, like a good pasture. And um, and you, the hospitality has been absolutely wonderful. I said to you, half-jokingly at the end, can I grab some of your boys and, like, take them to everyone? Because it was seamless. Everything just rolled and happened, and it was just fantastic. So that's why we're here, and I've taken the opportunity to steal Johannes down here for, for, for as long as we can before either the rain drives us out or the dark or the thunder or something. Um, so, and, and I say, back to the community, that it the, you know, it was, as I said at the end of today, was such a lovely feeling of humanity, of, of natural, like it's a, it's just a, it seems to be a lovely way um, to live. It was, it's so cohesive and, um, uh, and we've just felt so welcome. So, you know, thank you. Thank you for the hosting and, and, um, and, and, um, and having us here for the two days. And what a joy this rain is, hey? Mm, beautiful. How many meals in it, you reckon? Uh, so far, a few. Really? Yeah, some heavy pour, downfalls. Maybe yeah, that'll do. We'll take it. Um, no. Let's go back, um, Johannes, to the, where it all began. Mm. Day one, little man appeared in the world. Where where did that all happen? Can we go back yeah, that far? Yeah, absolutely. So I was born, actually born in Connecticut, um, and then moved to New York, upstate New York, when I was two years old. And grew up there, um, and really grew up very close to the land. Um, on the land, close to the land. On the land. On the land. Yeah. In the land. Yeah. In the yeah. forest. Yeah. On streams. On horseback. Um, beautiful childhood. And my father was always raising animals. He raised cattle, not on the scale we do here. You know, maybe twenty head, maybe ten head. He raised pigs. Um, he planted trees. We planted a lot of trees with him. And um, he taught us how to work, work hard. Um, and was just very committed and had a deep love for for landscape, for um, ecosystems. And uh, although he may not have said it like that, he, he kind of set the tone for me. And um, so I picked that up <clears throat> really from him. But... Um, I could probably take it even further back and tell you a little bit about about his upbringing and, mm. and even before that. So totally, let's do it. Should we do that? Yeah, totally. So uh, the Bruderhof uh, movement actually started back in 1920, and it began as a forming community. So you had a very small group of people on a very burned-out piece of land. Sound familiar? Trying to eke out a living, <laughs> right? And <laughs> whereabouts? Uh, it was in um, Zanerts, Germany, which is sort of central Germany. Yeah. Um, and the inspiration was to get away from the big cities, get back on the land, 
and to live out the teachings of Christ to the best of, of their ability. And, and that was in the 1920s, you said? 1920. So that was... Um, so it's just post-World War, yeah, World yeah, War yeah. One, yeah. And um, so that had a big influence. There was a lot of men on the, walking around on the roads in those days, sort of homeless, homeless guys who had fought in the war and probably had PTSD and who knows what. And um, there was a, a large segment of the youth of that time that were seeking for something genuine and meaningful for their lives. You know, they were kind of fed up with war. They were fed up with middle-class life. They wanted to go back to the roots and, and figure out life. What, what did it genuinely mean to be a person? And um, interestingly, 1924 is when Rudolf Steiner sort of kicked off with his, his thing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Anyways, um, and even back in those days, the, um, the community pioneered um, ideas like like shelter belts um, and, you know, thinking far ahead in terms of land management and improving the quality of the soil. And, and uh, So then it wasn't too long before Hitler came to power and the community um, was under serious, you know, stress and persecution um, raged by the Nazi soldiers. And it just escalated and got worse until... Um, the community was expelled from Germany, and they were persecuted because they represented a threat. Because that you, it was like a, a self-sustaining community. You had yeah. you, that was like we don't want you doing that stuff. <clears throat> well, was, to be. Yeah, right, so you had to be um, completely uh, obedient, subservient to yeah. Hitler. Yeah. And the community made it very clear that God was was the the one that had their allegiance, and. Um, that just didn't match. So then they were su- suspect. Uh, so that was quite a. And that was. That was a little while before the Second World War. He was at it for a yeah, while, wasn't he? That was actually the raid started. I think in nineteen thirty-five. Right. And the ex and expulsion was in nineteen thirty-seven. So that was a good three years before the war actually began. Um, and it was very fortuitous. At the time of the, the closing down of the community, two American or Canadian uh, ministers from another church were meet were um, were visiting them, and it was a church that we, were, we had actually joined with at that time, the Hutterites. And um, because they were there, uh, they weren't loaded into buses and taken to the concentration camp. But because uh-huh. they saw these two Americans, they didn't want to stir up the pot with the, you know, across the ocean, the war hadn't started yet. Um, they actually said, okay, we'll let you go. Get out of the country in 24 hours. Wow. Leave your homes. Everything. No, you could take us an upset. How many people are you talking? How many people had to? We're talking 100 people at least. Had to get yeah. out of there. Yeah. Wow. So, you couldn't just like book a plane out of there the next day on yeah. Webjet though, could you? Yeah. No. Those trains. Wow. Trains and boats. So then um, then the next part of the farming story sort of starts. So they found a, a very run-down farm in um, the Cotswold area of England. So they were welcomed there? They were welcomed there. Yeah. Yep. They were taken because they were refugees and and were able to purchase a, a property there, um, a large but very run-down farm. And... Um, the stipulation was that they had to bring that farm from grade four, which it was, to grade one, which would be the, the highest level. And they set about doing that. Uh, the brothers that were farmers at the time there, and, and some of them had studied agronomy and, and so on. And actually, in the four years that they lived at that community, they brought that farm from grade four to grade one. And it was a really massive transformation and they also built up a whole community but in the interim period world war ii started and you had english members Mm. because there was a lot of english people joining the community and then you had the germans and they were living together and that was not acceptable to the english government so it was a, a decision was then had to be made do we intern the german brothers and sisters for the length of the war do we all leave the country together our church is a pacifist church. We don't serve in the military. 
part of our faith. So the only country that would accept at that time during the war, the only country that would accept pacifists was Paraguay. Really? Country in uh, South countries. America, right? Yeah. Nestled there wow. below Brazil and yeah. above Argentina. And so it was, a, it was kind of just crazy. It was a step in faith. They had to pack up everything, get onto these boats that were going down to South America to bring meat back to Britain for the war, feed the troops. And when zigzagging across the ocean to, to escape the submarines, and over a period of about a year, they all moved down there. Wow. And landed landed on this property with no dwellings, um, just swamp, jungle, savanna. It's twenty thousand acre property, and had to carve out a life for themselves uh, with very little. Um, did they have to? Did they have to buy the property? Was it like a, like you're a yeah, refugee, so you can have it, or what was the? I think the sale of the property in um, they, they decided to sell the yeah, property yeah. in Cotswold, yeah, and use those finances to. They probably also had some helpful donors um, yep. that took that took uh, pity on on them. So, and then that's about the time that my well, my father was born in in England. Sorry, he was born in Germany. Let me back up. He was two weeks old when the community was expul expulsed out of Germany. So he was a very small little baby uh, of two weeks old. Wow. Went to Ger uh, England. England. The first four years of his life were in England and then moved to Paraguay with his family. And in Paraguay, it was a very uh, farm-based community, right? So they had cattle. Property came with probably a couple thousand head of cattle. Um, but they had to start, you know, dairy, you know, pigs, garden, grow their own food. I mean, they literally were out in, in, the, in the boondocks. Build their own houses. By Build their own houses, wow. you know, the whole bit. So that's how my dad grew up. And he um, did a lot of work with cattle on horseback at the time. So connection there. And then as he, I think when, at the age of 16, he left the community and work, went and worked on an estancia, which is the same as a station here. Mm. On a, you know, morning to, to night in a saddle and, and worked for probably four years on a, on a large station. And he moved to that station over there because that's, he'd reached a certain age and, yeah, and that like, was just what happened. He just wanted to try something different. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we encourage you know, our young people to do that and all the way through. It's a good, good idea to get perspective and yep. experience. So, so that was good. Eventually came back and, and then, you know, 20 years after, we went to, to Paraguay. We, we then realized it was just, it was too isolated and moved out of there and, and up to America. And, and that's sort of where the, the main um, grouping of our people are. So got through the war, I guess, then, in that case. Yep. So it stayed down there and then the dust settled elsewhere and then away to move up there. And where, whereabouts in the States? So main, eastern, eastern uh, U.S., so upstate New York, mm -hmm. uh, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. Oh, then you came along. Mm. Yep. And then I was born in mm. 1970. See, and your grandfather, was he was in Germany. He was there. Obviously, if your father was born there, your, yep. part of your family was, was, was you know, already a part of that community back then. Yeah. <clears throat> so your so – your, is the – is the – so you're one of the, I guess, f founding families – is that fair to say? Is there, well, there are lots of yeah, families there. Yeah. How many, I mean, there was a lot, lot of families that yeah, part of that? You know, there's, I think it started with seven wow. people. Yeah. And then it grew from there. So, yeah, both sides of my family um, were part of that. Yeah. It was early, you know, the first decade of the community. Yeah, yeah. wow. And so, um, 1970, you, you turned up. And so we get back to your horses, mm. forest, trees, cows, mm -hmm. farm. Yeah. And faith. Yeah. I, um, so I grew up, you know, and it was, it was just a beautiful, beautiful childhood, um, surrounded by, you know, people that I had a great respect for, both my own relatives and people who weren't my relatives, which is 
a beautiful thing too. And um, then got to uh, high school, went through high school, and then and during my high school years, I um, I was quite concerned about uh, sort of civil rights and also quite concerned about what was happening in in Central America. And um, at the time, I actually thought, well, look, I'll, I'll go down to El Salvador and help these people that are, that are suffering. That was just sort of what I wanted to do. But <laughs> I got the advice, look, if you go down there, you have a cross on your back. Mm. You'll just get blown up. And what was happening down there? Excuse uh, my ignorance. What was the sort so of... So America the- uh, and the CIA were um, oh, drug causing drug. unrest. And a lot of land was being taken away from peasants who had farmed it for hundreds of years. And, you know, there was just this, this conflict between power and poverty. Was it was there, was there a drug trade mixed that up came in that? Later. Yeah, right. That came later. There was also, I don't know if you've heard of a archbishop called Oscar Romero. He was an archbishop at the time, and he actually was assassinated because he sided with the poor and tried to help them. Yeah, right. So that was a, an inspiration to me. Anyways, I, did, I didn't end up going there, but I went. Um, there was an organization in California that worked uh, for the rights of farm workers. And m- most of these farm workers are people that come across the border from Mexico and, and further south. His name was Cesar Chavez, and I worked with his organization for a period, um, basically trying to improve their lot and trying to get rights for them and involved in all sorts of um, different activities like great boycotts to try and force the growers to um, give basic rights to these people. So to give an idea of what kind of rights we're talking about, like having a toilet where you work, not being sprayed with herbicides while you're picking fruit, <laughs> um, having a house to sleep in, you know, having a lunch break. Wow. So these were the basic rights for that we were Trying to uh, to help help uh, bring in, so that that was a, a, a pretty formative uh, period in my life. But as I as I went through that, um, the place where I'd come from began to make more and more sense. Like why my parents and grandparents had chosen to to live in a community with the set of values they live with, and it all kind of came together. And it actually made sense, and I felt, look, that's where I need to need to go. Need How many to- years between <clears throat> leaving there and then, then it was, doing so that full circle? It yeah. wasn't that long. It was 88 to 89. Yeah. Right? And I was straight out of high school. So I was young and... And also had a lot of fun, by the way. It was, mm. it was a great, great experience. So high school um, within the community, or yeah. uh, no? Yeah. I went to public high school. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We used to do that, and yeah. very good experience. Yeah, meet other people, make other friends. Yeah, see what's going on. But yeah, that sounds good. And uh, but then I came back, and um, at the time, the community needed male nurses. So I had the grades, so they, uh, they, somebody said, hey, can you, can you study nursing? Which was actually... At, at age what? what? What age were you then? 20. <clears throat> okay, yeah, a couple of years out. And then so bang. I was, and, and it wasn't something I would have chosen to do mm. at all. But I, the community needed it, and I thought, hey, fair enough. Give it a go. And um, did that. And actually, then after that, you know, and at the time, my uncle, who was um, in the leadership, told me, look, because I wanted to study farming and forestry. That was my passion. He said, look, you can figure out farming and forestry. Just do this, you know, because we need this. So I said, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Do that. And um, so then I worked in, after I graduated, um, Worked in primary care, so like GP type setting, and also worked on pre hospital ambulance as paramedic and, and, and that kind of work. So I did a lot of that over the next 10 years. So that was different. 
and a lot of experience there yeah. with, with people and with suffering and uh, and that sort. I guess a bit of, you know, the worst, well, it's not the worst type of suffering, but kind of the the terminal type of suffering, <clears throat> a bit fair, but, you know, yeah. that as well. Yeah. What was the, what do you think it was uh, for those couple of years away? I mean, did you need those few years away to then be able to look back at, <clears throat> perspective, give you a different perspective and mm-hmm. go, you know what, it was a reference point that you circled back to? What was Yeah, absolutely. Like- I think I needed, I needed to get away and to see what else was out there, right? And then to make my, uh, draw my own conclusions about how to live my life. You know, I guess it's a bit like coming of age or, you know, you never want someone to do something because their dad did it or because somebody else did it. But you actually want to live your life based on what you feel, what I feel is is right and true for me. And um, so that that was pivotal, pivotal in that way and, and very good. Yeah, so. Nursing. Nursing, you know. Within the community? Within, um, yeah, yeah. The, obviously, the ambulance work was in the locality, Excellent. yeah, rural, rural area, um, and then eventually got married. Um, it was a blessing. Married to my wife Anne, and and uh, we had four kids, beautiful kids, and um, eventually um, we moved to England. Also to help out in the um, the clinic over there, the community. So the, the, there was another community established over there. At yeah, some yeah. Point. They've been there for a while. <clears throat> did did the did the Paraguay when when everyone left there? Did, did that split kind of thing? Did they some go to the states and some? Yeah, there? so they went. You know, like in our, you can imagine either imagine our community a bit like a Catholic order or like the military. So mm. if you're needed somewhere, then that's where you go. Mm. And that's a commitment, a voluntary commitment you make when you join, is that you're willing to to support and go wherever you're needed mm. and give all your energies, mm. um, you know, for for that. And that's just part and parcel of uh, of who we are. So went over there for three years, and then um, in the meantime, the community in in Australia had begun. And so I came into Australia on my nursing license. Yeah, right. All right. Back in those days, it was fairly easy to um, to immigrate on a on a skilled visa. And um, nurses are a shoe in. At least they were. I think they still are. Right? Yeah. They're, they're highly so, sought after. So here I was in Australia, and I was tasked with taking on the farm and and uh, and the abattoir. Wow. And uh, so that's what I've been doing for the last. What is it? 18, 19 years. years, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. When when you say the farm, <clears throat> I guess <clears throat> the community is on the farm. So the farm is a large part of it because there's <clears throat> obviously food production, there's acres, there's um, lots of activity, um, different mm-hmm. enterprises. Yeah. The, the, the farm is a major part of... The community, just geographically, but I guess the interaction and the, I mean, it's a, <clears throat> the support that the farm gives to the community through food production and, mm. you know, nature and just the setting and the sanctuary that it is, um, that's a that's a big job, if you yeah. know, I imagine. Right, and so big responsibility. You know, you look at the community, and and there's there's many responsibilities to to keep it all going. You know, there's a business. Like, if I can just back up. So when we mm. first bought the place, the vision was, hey, let's have, let's go back to having a farming community, a community that can actually be supported by the land, by the farm. Which was all, had always been the intention of the, the previous um, uh, iterations of the community in well, Paraguay. Not, and... More by necessity, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's really all they had. Yep. Um, I think we've always had craftsmanship built into our community so whether it's turning bowls in Paraguay or you know building farming gear um, in England yeah. gates and you know hay, hay bale stackers and things like that back in the 60s 
there's always been a component of, of manufacturing. And I think it's important to understand that when you have a community, you really need to have meaningful work for everybody. Mm. And that includes people that are very able and also includes disabled people, old people, young yeah. people. So you, so farming is a part of that, but it'll never, it'll never give, you know, that full so um, complement of, 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 of work yeah. and, and um, so anyways um, and that first attempt at, at forming here in Australia with very different conditions than anything we're used to before but also a degraded landscape flopped was unsuccessful what 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 does unsuccessful look like it, it looks like less money at the end of the year than at the beginning for one thing uh, it looks like, you know, crop failure, sheep that cost more to run than, than returned. Um, and granted, you know, there wasn't a lot of experience there for that, and that came slowly, but I think also we, we plunged in with a conventional mindset. And that's an important part of the story. So I think you could almost say the farming back in the 19, late 1920s, early 30s, and then in Paraguay would, could be termed a regenerative sort of farming, even though it didn't carry that name. But then the community moved to um, the States and the Green Revolution was, was firing up and we just went along with that. Yeah. I think we actually moved away from sort of the organic or regenerative type practice and we're just taken up with the new Green Revolution, and, and it seemed to work beautiful, and, and why not? And then we also segued more into manufacturing as our main, our main income. And so coming back here, we just kind of stuck in and began to farm conventionally like our neighbors did, and like the agronomist told us from the elders. All right. This is your schedule of <clears throat> This is what you stuff. do. You know, here's your prescriptive uh, dose of whatever side it was. So yeah, so when I came, when I arrived in 2004, it was clear that we couldn't run this place conventionally. It was not going to work out. And the, most of the property had been leased out because we just didn't know what to do. Yep. And we needed some kind of a return. But we could see that, you know, the property being leased was making it, it was degrading it even it was, further because yeah. that's generally what what happens or can happen. So then really started the hard work of figuring out, well, what do we do? How, how do we, you know, I wasn't even thinking regeneration. I was thinking, how do we even it's make this work? Yeah. You know? And, um, so. Well, and why you, like, like you, you, you had farm experience, you liked forests and trees and cows. And then, you know, you came over here as a nurse. Did you come over here knowing you were going to be sort of on responsible for farm? Or yeah. You, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, then, and then how, was, was that a, <laughs> was that, was there a recruitment process, you know, back in England and they go, oh, Johannes, you know about cows, how about you go there? Or there's a job ad going? Yeah, look, like, I, what was the, I'm what not was sure. The, I just, I just got picked. I'm not <laughs> Not sure what the okay, so it was, it, was more, was. it was more of a, you're needed over there. You're needed. Yeah. Okay. Um, so get going. Yep. And then off we went. And it was, it was a beautiful thing. I was really happy to do it um, and just get stuck into it. So interestingly enough, in 1999, preparing for Y2K, no, that's Remember right. that? Yeah, the world yeah, was going to stop. Yeah, 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 all, yeah, that's it. All the communities <laughs> so, going to go down. So our communities were sort of concerned about right. that. Yeah. And uh, myself and, and one of the other guys were tasked with just looking into, can we graze a few animals, um, you know, and can we grow a bit of oats and can we kind of get our feet wet in farming again? This community that I was on prior was pretty much just manufacturing. So... Um, part of that was we took a trip, him and me, and we went and visited three different farms that were grazing holistically. Right? So that was my first sort of ever exposure to grazing management 
hadn't even thought of it before. And where, which the one? concept. Which, where were they? Where'd you Pennsylvania. Go? Oh, okay, right, right. So this was back in the States in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And so, um, and that, you know, I loved it. It was exciting. But then I, you know, life moved on. We didn't, Y2K came and went and we were all still there. And, uh, but then I found myself down here and remembering, suddenly remembered that, that day and began looking and thinking and digging and came across Alan Savory and Holistic Grazing Management. And um, actually Judy Earle um, at the time was a holistic instructor and, and she came here and, and got me going on you know, the grazing charts, on you know, wall charts on the on paper and on the tricks of grazing management and read the books and the manual. And that was our first, our first step. And what, when you say manual, you said you, there was um, holistic management, Alan Savory's. Um, yeah, there's a there's a of, uh, there's like a textbook and yeah, then a manual that's with it, yeah. more detailed, yeah. sort of prescriptive so you stuff. So had those two as as your yep. textbooks, and Judy's guidance. Judy's guidance, she was excellent, and um, just took up about a hundred hectares out of the twenty three hundred. The rest was leased and just began to experiment. Had 50 head of cattle, um, just steers. We were raising for slaughter and began to measure and graze and learn. And um, <clears throat> a couple of years later, and, and, and I was also measuring, you know, conventional grazing outside of that, mm. just to, to have something to reference with. When you say measuring, you were measuring um, how much grass was there, what was eaten? Yeah, so yeah. it's a simple formula based on the weight of the animal um, and their average daily gain rate, and that dictates how much grass they've eaten. Sort of an accepted mm. industry norm um, in terms of DSEs or kilos of dry, dry matter. So and then came a dry period, and you know, half year of, of dry, and we found that the paddocks that we were grazing holistically were actually producing 50% more biomass than the other paddocks. And so I showed it to the other guys and I said, look, you know, I think we have something here and other people are doing this and they're finding the same thing. Can we expand? And so we did. We took on another couple hundred hectares slowly, still releasing out most of the property and continued like that. And then Around about that time, there was a there was an Australian story that featured a man from Bylong Valley called Peter Anders. Yep. <laughs> yep. So we contacted. No, actually, first we purchased his book. Oh yeah, back from the brink. Back from the brink, and read that. That was exciting. And then we managed to get in contact with him and had him come up. And um, actually, had a, a wonderful relationship with him over the years. And, um, so when was this? Like this is two thousand six. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> cool. Yep. So and, and began you know slowly. Uh, we never jumped into anything just pell mell, but we tested ideas and put in a little contour bank and dabbled. Observe it. Dabbled with it, and observed the the results. And um, property was still most of the property had lousy fencing. Uh, it's just, and the paddocks were degraded, and and there was a few little bright spot, bright spots, but not much. So then, um, 2007, the CMA at the time, Catchment Management Authority, was making money available for, you know, bringing farms up to speed. You know, you, they they gave money for farm planning course, and then. <clears> the, <throat> Once the plan was there, then they would help fund on a 50-50 basis the infrastructure that was needed to make the farm viable. And um, so that was, that was beautiful. We were able to put in you know, many kilometers of fencing. We were able to plant 30,000 trees. We were able to put in um, water points, 50 water points across the property. So it was massive, uh, a massive year. We were able to sow. Um, multi-species perennial pastures into all our cropping country. Incidentally, they all died later because the soil was really degraded. But we did all that work. 
and um, and and I actually had at the end of that we actually had the tools, the infrastructure to be able to manage the whole property mm. holistically, or you know, management intensive grazing. Put in the new stockyards, you know, all of that. And so the, a number of different things. A bunch of stuff. Yeah. A bunch of stuff, and, but it really, you know, put us in a place where we could actually manage the place correctly. Was it aimed towards and encouraging people to take on the holistic farm management kind of stuff, or you just apply that to the to the project? Yeah. So, actually, run by the catchment management people, they were primarily concerned about catchment health, and and the money that was going out to the different farms involved was to sort of create ground cover to create some health in in the whole catchment so that you know there'd be some more some more resilience but it wasn't specifically focused at holistic grazing management or or any other modalities it was more of a broad um what can we do to help our catchment which imp- included planting trees it in- included um planting pasture into cropping country you know it included you know fencing and and also fencing out the creek, mm. and that's why they paid for the water, um, was to keep cattle and grazing animals out of the creek and allow it to rehabilitate and slow the flow and, and all that. So that was sort of their goal. But, they, of course, they were happy with uh, grazing management as a tool in that space. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering whether we might have missed a bit of that. We might look. Um, I got a feeling that some of that might have been missed at the end there. So just just go back over Peter Andrews. So you 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 saw Australian story, mm. read the book, yep. got him here, implemented a number of the you know some contouring. Yeah. Did you do some of the um, not just contouring, but within the creek, putting the 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 leaky weirs and that sort of actually not, zone mm, stuff. Not really. No, because <clears throat> um, it's a fourth order stream and, and you can't really do that uh, do that mm. um would have liked to but not possible so we we actually worked higher in the catchment you know um up here in the valleys and and the first order sort of streamlets um and sort of wet our teeth there um but that you know was just another important tool and it, but it didn't answer the whole challenge of restoring landscape. So what did it? What did it do? What changes did you see having put that in in place? I mean, it may be hard to sort of identify because there were other factors potentially. But what were some of the? What was restored? What was the right. the, the outcomes there? So number one, I would say fencing out the creek allowed it to reestablish itself for vegetation to grow for shrubs, trees. Um, you put a few deciduous. Prior to that, obviously, it was dry, right? And the cattle all go to the creek. That's where the last bits of forage are growing. And it was just a grazed out mass, frankly. And every time it rained, it eroded more soil. And, and mm. you know, it's just a bad cycle. Um, higher in the landscape, uh, we put in one test uh, level, level contour. And um, when it did fill and then allow, you know, ir- subsoil irrigation, we actually had a measurable increase per year in um, grass produced. So we could show that, you know, above that bank was sown so much grass produced per hectare and below was, you know, an extra ton, let's say, mm, cool. per hectare. And so we, we knew that, yeah, this is this is doing something. Mm. But nothing was like flashing lights. You know, progress is, is incremental, um, I've found, in the Australian landscape and, and with the weather patterns we have and so on. So it's... It's step by step, um, slow by slow. And um, uh, what was the next sort of phase or, or practice that you you put in place then? And when, when where are we up to here in the in the chronologically? Yeah, so we're probably around two thousand eight here. Yeah, um, two thousand nine was another very dry year, mm. and so started thinking about soils. Started thinking a lot about soils, and I began approaching you know, a lot of different people to help us with our soils. And one of them was uh, was Bart Davidson. He wasn't with Maya at that point yet, but he was a soil consultant, and we had him in for a couple of days and had him do an assessment 
on the place and, and give some advice. That was helpful. Also looked at, um, you know, the Neil Kinsey soil balancing approach to soils, um, where you test your soils, identify what's missing, and then get expert advice on how to how to replace what's missing physically. And so I, I, we took the soil samples, you had to send them to the States to a special lab, had, went through all of that, got the results back, and the prescription was going to cost me 2500 bucks. Was it, prescri- was it prescription sell? <laughs> sell your farm. <laughs> we were like, we buy some more land. <laughs> uh, yeah, how much was it? 20? 2500 bucks a hectare. For the Amelia and and the to, things to that you did to balance soil. Soil. with a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of whatever. Lime, gypsum, whatever. Um, My goodness. It, it was just out of reach. It was not economical, obviously, you know, at that point in time, land cost about that. That's right. Um, land was a lot cheaper back in those days. So, you know, that, that, that didn't happen, obviously. And then it began to play around with Bart. Bart was into the compost idea, so... We bought some, um, there's a fellow called Bruce Piconi who is doing composted fertilizer out near Moree. And so we began playing with that. And, um, and it was successful. You know, we, we, saw, we saw a response. But we were still using, um, by that time we'd gone back to growing forage oats in winter monoculture. We were still spraying herbicides um, for knockdown, we were still using conventional uh, salt-based fertilizers to, to nourish the crop, but we were also putting in the compost. And um, so, yeah, it, it was step by step. And, and during those years, let's say from 2009 till, you know, maybe maybe 2014, um, we kind of noticed that everything sort of plateaued. Despite our efforts, despite doing what we thought was pretty darn good grazing management, you know, we, you know, the the increase in productivity just stopped. We weren't seeing more species coming up in our pastures, you know. And um, around about that time, I believe, um, Bart had gone over uh, to Maya, and that whole process was beginning, the Maya grazing platform. And we were working with him uh, with that process and trying to figure out, you know, how that would look and how it would work um, for us and other graziers. And that was a fascinating period. But, you know, just in the back of my mind, you know, we, we just knew we weren't actually making the progress we needed to make. And... Then along came 2017, and in 2017, I made contact with Christine Jones, and she came out to the property and had a look around, and we had a long talk. Sorry, what year was that? 20... 2017. 79, yeah. And she talked about biology, soil biology, and plant diversity. And the way she explained it, the way she um, you know, educated me around those two two key things was was a major light bulb moment for me. And we actually then did a did an a field day here at D'Antonio where I think a couple hundred people showed up, and we had Christine talk to us about that those topics. Oh, twenty eighteen. It was twenty eighteen. Was so it? I a think bit later. Nineteen. Twenty eighteen. Yeah, I see. So. And that was just a pivotal, pivotal moment for us. Um, and during the the previous couple of years, I'd been um, doing some some testing with biological products, and um, found that yes, you could measure a massive increase in soil fungal population and in the diversity of the soil. Bio, biological community um, when you at, use biological amendments and also that in control plots and in um, plots that were treated with conventional fertility, we were not seeing that response. So that was another tick. Yes, it's true. 
it's measurable. Another thing so pushed us in, in, in the direction. Um, so 2018, we had that field day. We were already sliding into drought. And that drought proved to be incredibly challenging, as it was for all Australian farmers. It was an incredibly challenging period, and very stressful, <clears throat> and very difficult um, to see the landscape just degrade. And we actually thought, you know, we were pretty good grazing managers, <laughs> right? We had a plan. We based it on the worst possible rainfall uh, going back 100 years. And we, you know, reduced. You're very conservative in your. Conservative, yeah. reduced our numbers. We just had 220 breeders. That was all we held on 2,300 hectares. We thought we were in pretty good shape. But that drought was, you know, I think the worst prior rainfall was in the 400 mils somewhere in there. And this drought was 272 mils in that year. And that just did us. And we had to buy hay at great expense, as most other farmers did too. Carried cattle through and fed them and got to the point where we couldn't buy more hay and set the dates for the trucks to come and locked in the first truck. And the day we loaded them, the first rain came. We had a big rainfall event, and so we could cancel the future shipments and hung on to those. So that was about as close as you want to get, um, that we could hang on to that <clears throat> those breeders, which were uh, Kit Farrow blood, bloodline. Mm, I want to get to that. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we got through it, but it left some scars, and... Um, what did you learn? What 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 did you learn in that process that you've now changed, implemented, mitigated against? Yeah, so I think we'll be more cautious even even yet. But I think it wasn't so much what did we learn in terms of stocking numbers or grazing. It was that it just increased the drive to to get the soils back into well, to build soil carbon to build mm -hmm. biological <clears throat> soil communities, to build natural capital, you know, all those important things that mitigate drought. And, and it just just gave me a ton of energy to pursue those with, with great great energy and, and vigor. Because you, I guess, you, you, was it that you knew how bad it could be and you never wanted to go there again. And did you kind of know this is the op you needed to do this? Otherwise, well, I think you it was would that, go that way. It was that, and the knowledge that with a changing climate, the next round could likely be worse. Could be worse, yeah. And, right. You know, for the community, the impact was that we ran out of rainwater and had to truck in water from town yeah. for drinking and, and so on. And to see everything dry out, all the dams empty, the, the creek dry uh, into. And, and at the same time, knowing that a living system wouldn't do this, you know, um, that there are the functions in the Australian landscape to take you through those droughts if you allow them to express themselves. So it was the landscape was kind of sick. Yeah. It had a low yep. Without a immunity. Doubt. Yeah. And I think still, you know, if I would have to sort of give it a grade of, Zero to ten, ten, 10 being the best, you know, I think we're still around the four. We're not even halfway there in terms of restoring that vibrant life. So with that in mind, um, you know, the, the, what we had learned from Christine Jones just took on a, a really powerful meaning. And so we went really hard. When that drought broke, we went very hard. We planted as much country as we could to multi-species. We put out as much biological stimulant as we could. We found micronutrient foliars and applied those to the plants where we knew they were deficient. And we got an amazing response, a rapid response. And so for the last three years uh, since the drought broke, um, We've been pursuing those angles, and, but always with an open mind to find 
you know, what, what are we missing in our, in our toolbox? There's got to be, you know, more tools that we can apply and, and also very much, um, very much keen to, to build the community of farmers that farm regeneratively, to share the knowledge. Um, actually, our local <clears throat> Swan, Swanvale Land Care Group is, is working on a project to rehydrate the Swan Brook. For, um, about 12 properties involved, in, and we're slowly working towards that, uh, along with Maloon Institute. So, <clears throat> so a catchment level, yeah, catchment level project, project that yeah. would address soils would potentially uh, bring in Maloon to do um, works in the creeks, you know, with with um, permissions from the government. You know, nothing's really off the table. But obviously, funding is the is the challenge. What does the government think about? That sort of stuff. Well, there's been a shift, and uh, there's been a recognition that Malena's had success in some catchments, and um, so we're we're hoping that that can can increase and grow, and um, return life to the return life to the uh, streams and rivers of Australia is really what needs to happen. You know, not just in the Swanbrook, but everywhere. Right. So they're not they're not thinking it's too wacky. That they reckon it's there's something in it. No, it because it's actually been validated scientifically. Yeah. And they've had their scientists on to it and yeah. well, but I don't think it's a shoe in yet, but it's no. there there's the doors are opening. Mm. And, and the you know, the the work is happening. So with the toolbox, what what else is there are there are you aware of what's missing? Is there, you know, mm. some practices that you know of, heard of, seen data on and going, I want to do that? Yeah, well, I think the last two days were, were <laughs> part of that, you know. Um, I think there's something definitely that we can take out of out of the two two days we just had together with biodynamics. Yeah. Um, but that we, wasn't a lot of question. I wasn't even thinking of that, actually. But, uh, yeah, but yes, but, it's good, good. <laughs> but, but I think that, you know. For, and, you know, but that, I think, you know, with just the tools that we do have now, you know, and, and these have been applied worldwide, the results have been amazing, astounding, um, beyond what science is willing to believe is possible. And, and that's pretty cool. Um, and that gives me a lot of hope. You know, yes, we have challenges, but also, yes, we have tools that can, can rise to meet those, providing we're good managers. And, um, you know, and I think, as we heard in the last couple of days, you know, having empathy for for all things living, for the land, for the animals, for the people. Um, th- those are all, the, all those things go together, I think, um, and are part of the package. Um, yeah. Um, so that's interesting you say you reckon you're, you're at four. Mm. I mean, a lot of people would look we went for a little farm tour yesterday afternoon, didn't we, after the mm. day one, and that was wonderful. You know, at the end of the day, beautiful little spot down there where we were, and I wouldn't be many people who reckon you're on a four out of ten. Um, I'm not saying you're being too harsh, but it's just interesting. I mean, it's, you know, if and I don't doubt that. If, you know, if that's where you feel you need to take it, that's that's fantastic. I mean, I think that's... It's almost a case that feels like, okay, not just here, but a lot of places that I go to or, you know, where we, we know of and <clears throat> like it's the potential is almost almost limitless in a mm-hmm. way, isn't it? Like where's, what is it, a 10? Well, we don't yeah. even know what a 10 looks like. Well, I think, you know, we know that historically, you know, you know when white, white settlement started, we know that soil carbon levels were 5 to 10% of soil. Now, you know, on the property here, we would probably average two to two and a half. The Australian average is less than that. Now, just imagine if we could even get it to 5%, right, let alone 10%. Imagine the life, productivity, and resilience that you'd see in such a landscape, and that's, that's the goal. Um, 
that's the goal that, that we need to be aiming at collectively as, as you know, Australian farming community um, to get there under the rainbows. Is that a rainbow? Is that, was that one and then another? Yeah, it almost looks like there's one going that way, one going that way. I think there's two of them, but we, they just fade into the cloud there. Eh? That's incredible. Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and so where Danthony is positioned between Glenness and Inverell, I probably didn't say that earlier on, you know, that's to be a f- producer of food because ultimately that's what we're doing isn't as farmers. Mm. In the process, <clears throat> well, not – I guess it's a chicken or the egg. I mean, you, you, you can't help but produce nutritious food if you're looking after the environment like you guys are, you know. So what, what's the, what is, you know, the primary motivation – as a farmer, is it to improve the environment and then you grow good food or are you just growing, we want to grow really good food and you have to improve the environment at the same time? Not that that's a chore, but it's like, where's the focus in there? Yeah, sure. So for me, um, as a Christian and as a man of faith, I, you know, part of, part of the task you know, that we have, I believe, as, as, as people on earth is to care for creation. Right, um, and you, know, you can find that in the book of Genesis. Which is care for the land, care for the God's creation, and um, you know. So coming, <clears throat> coming to Australia, you know, just to say, it was <clears throat> it was kind of confronting to come into a landscape that was as degraded as as it was. <laughs> And, well, yeah. But but not only yeah, you know, and I'm not blaming people. Mm. It's just a different climate as well, and so variable, and so hard to manage. I came from a place where you know every winter was predictable. Spring came, summer came, autumn came, rain was there. It was a predictable yearly cycle, with some variability, but mainly just pretty good. Come here and a yet to see a year that's the same as any other year that I've experienced here. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so that sort of was something I, I was grappling with, right? And then you bring the faith side of it in and say, well, we're supposed to care for this place. Now, why do we care for it? Well, because it sustains you know, people and animals, and it's God's creation. It's precious. It's living. It's it's um, it's what he has made, and so that's why it's important. And, and right, you know, and in more practical terms, there's a community here of 200 people that need sustenance, that need food, like you were saying, we're food producers that need a place to live, that need water, um, you know, and a living ecosystem gives all those things, right? down to the water table, you know, water to pump out of the ground as needed or, you know, to, to produce the beef or the vegetables or, or, or whatever whatever we're producing. And it's really, if you don't mind, I'll just carry on with this thought because mm-hmm. as the more I've, the more I've uh, learned about, you know, creation and how, all these things work together, you know, through the wonderful work of Christine Jones or Peter Andrews or whoever it was. There's many others that have I've learned from. The more you see that nature actually shows us or gives us a pattern of how we should live and how we should be as people. So if you think about the soil biological community and the plants that they interact with, you know, they're very diverse, they're very different, but they all need to be fed and watered and and they actually depend on each other for their life. So you have the mycelial networks underground, my, mycorrhizal fungi that are taking energy and water and taking it from places of abundance to places where there's not enough or to plants that are weakened. You know, there's signaling going on in the soil to alert, you know, plants or biology about approaching disease or possible attack. You know, so there's all this symbiosis going on, and it's really powerful. And then I think to myself, well, how are we doing as, you know, as a society? 
in that space? Shouldn't we be living in the same way? And and, and part and so that really inspires me around the thought of community and you know in D'Antonia and as a Bruderhof community movement, we attempt to do that. Obviously, you know, it's flawed at times and and and, and whatnot, but that's the vision. The vision is to to live that out. Um, and it's to me astounding to see the amazing creativity and um, of creation and how it it really instructs us um, in the patterns of of what's important. So, yeah, it's mimicking. It's kind of a it's a it's a it's a tutor, and you yeah. know, we, if we mimic that in some way, and it's a word that gets used a lot, and I guess it's pretty pretty true. Mm. Well, I guess mimic. Mimic can be sort of not misconstrued, but like mimic is copying, but I guess it it's, it has to be almost adapted in a way, hasn't it? Like there's a lot of people to consider in the community. Mm. Nature has its blueprint. <clears throat> you know, it's even just thinking about, you know, sacred geometry and, you know, all those crazy patterns and Fibonacci and that stuff. There's a, there's, there's a design there mm. that is just internally fascinating, isn't it? And that's just the stuff that's right. almost stationary. You know, the shell, right. the shape of a shell or the structure of a tree. Mm. You know, when you throw in the design of animals or plant movement or pasture succession, it's um, right. It is eternally fascinating. You know, and how how in, in a in a living mm. ecosystem sacrifice is absolutely necessary. In fact, death is necessary for life to continue. Yeah. It's a cycle. So, you know, and that's very much part of our communal existence is we have to be willing to sacrifice time or energy or whatever it is for the common good. Mm. And actually you see that, you see that throughout society in pockets, right? People who are willing to give and aren't looking to get, you know, people who are willing to share it's not um, is absolutely not just found in community. It can be found anywhere, but it's a spirit. It's a generous spirit. Um, so does does the I mean for you to and I think it makes absolute sense. Of, you know, a community of I mean, I what's the I watched the second you know Avatar the second the what is it called the sequel the other day with the kids and I'd seen the first one and um, I mean there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. Um, uh, and I think it's all originally purposeful what they what they had in there in terms of community and living and even just the underground kind of communication and so on. How does one with your grip on <clears throat> the blueprint or the the structure or the the create the, the the creative opportunity that nature represents? How do you? roll it out in a community? How do you kind of approach and say, hey, we're going to start doing nature stuff? <laughs> you know, is that a conversation you can have? Yeah, look, like like, like I was saying, the community is sort of a whole, and, and I look at, you know, the landscape or the farm as a sort of a holistic uh, organism. Well, the community is actually an organism as well that, the you know, the farm landscape is part of, mm. just a part of. So. So you have that, and um, it is a beautiful, very practically, it's a beautiful thing because when there was thirty thousand trees to plant, I didn't do it. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of help. You know, yeah, there was yeah. there was uh, a crew of fifteen people planting trees for two months. Yep, and uh, just as an example, and and where where the need is, there the effort can go, and maybe another day it'll be, hey, we need everybody at the sign shop to get this order out and then we go over there and hook in and, and do get that the order out yeah um so it's very practical very down to earth as well mm. um and in terms of that and so what of the i'm conscious of time the darkness they are incredible that that those rainbows over there gorgeous not so keen on those turbines but that's another story um so conscious of time so what and what we're going to do? I reckon I'm going to suggest this, giving the given the time, and we're going to pack up, and hopefully not in the dark. Is we we're both going to my grazing tomorrow. Yep. What I might do is grab you for ten minutes, and we'll do this Q and A bit just on camera, 
over there somewhere. Yep. That just do that as opposed to stopping and doing it now. Do we? There's one other su- subject. Yeah. And that was the farrow cattle. Oh yeah, let's go there. Let's go there. Cool. Because I think it's really. Have you been eating your carrots? Because you're going to need your good eyes tonight. If we we're, we're back up, let me back up. No, go. I'm 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 really interested because yeah. I saw Kit at the My Grazing thing some years ago, yeah. and it was really interesting. Yeah. So, Farrow cattle is really. Um, he's been working on the genetics over in the states for for quite some time, and the cattle are developed to be fertile. Small to medium frame, so like a 500 kilo, 525 kilo cow. Um, very tough, so they don't get any extras. Um, we don't crunch the cattle. They get a five in one or a seven in one if it's a female. Um, and most importantly, that they can finish on grass. This is a breed that is really not, progeny finish on grass. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's not a new thought. It's just taking cattle back to the way they used to be before they were bred for feedlots. Yeah. So it's going back, but also going forwards, and, and these cattle <clears throat> are proving to be very, very good in that space. They're also, you know, the bulls what we're finding are able to, you know, join a lot more cows than the normal, you know. So what? How many, how many do you, you? Well, they can go. They can, you know, do their 50, 50 cows. Pretty easy. But then they can do that three times a year. Yeah, cool. And they don't fall apart. Yep. Um, and we're so confident in uh, the calving ease uh, side of the, the deal that there's a hundred dollar um, guarantee and vet vet bill is covered for any cow that needs to have their calf pulled. They're all yeah. Wow, that's cool. So over time, we hope to build the markets, you know, for the progeny and and all of that. But we're really excited about the the concept of these cattle. And where are those? Where are they going to go? What What's the end? Who's the end? Can you know eater there? Is it obviously community? Lots to feed. But is there an eye? You go. Well, we need to get this into the world. We want people eating it. We want people wanting yeah, it. Yeah. So there's there's a. a you know, diff- different ways to market it. One is the Roots program, which is a, a new beef program that is marketing regenerative beef. And we fit that, that bill so that that's a, a place we could go to. Um, Highland beef could possibly be another another mm-hmm. source, but there, there's plenty. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had, I think this past year we sold maybe 90 bulls and, and the year before was maybe 75. So slowly growing and slowly getting them out there. Uh, but it really fits in what this whole property and the whole regenerative process um, is happening here. It just really fits us. Because they're a low maintenance. Because like they're, cause they're yeah. a smaller frame, they don't eat as much. And the, the f- like, you know, that's pretty clear, but the the significance of that was fascinating when he presented the bit of a table about you know that scale of cow, cattle weight. Mm. You know, there was like six fifty kilo cows down to a four fifty or whatever. Yeah, and then it had their average calf size at weaning. I think it was weight at weaning. Right, and the it was fascinating that the. Um, the calf weights were about the same, whether yeah. it was a 650 cow, I mean, there's a bit of variation, 650 kilo cow or a 450. Right. But as a percentage, like the cut, like the weaned, <clears throat> smaller frame, farrow, farrow? Yeah, farrow. Farrow yeah. Um, one was, you know, might have represented 50% of the, of the body weight of the cow. Right, and, and, and so when you actually look at your productivity per hectare in That's terms it. of kilos of beef, you're yeah. way up. Yeah. So you can actually have a 30% increase in kilos of beef per hectare mm. by going with this type of animal. So, yeah, kilos of grass eaten produces X number of kilos of right. of beef. But because the cows are smaller, like, like a 700-kilo <laughs> cow, which is probably the size we used to run, is going to eat a lot more grass to produce the same Same, calf. Yeah, the same same amount of meat or calf. The, the efficiency or, yeah. is just worse. Totally, totally. So, yeah, so that, you know. And the, the main stud is uh, Furukabad Station. Um, they're about, whatever, half an hour's drive east of us. Towards Glen. And we're yes. co-producers, so yeah. our, the, 
you know, the bulls we produce go to them and then they finish them off and sell them. Mm. That's how that works. That's awesome. Um, let's finish this tomorrow, you reckon? Yep. Do a I'll bit do. of that. Sure. Um, that's why I'm sorry that we didn't get down here a bit earlier. I mean, just the way we finished the course and the generators and the whole thing. What a lovely little yeah, spot it was to a be. Bit wasn't it? No, that's meant to be, you know, yeah. and this was such a great spot. Um, Johannes, thank you so much. I'm so, I'm so thrilled the way you, not so much the way you handled it, but the way you brought back the history of your family and, um, you know the the community and how you got to be here. That's absolutely fascinating. I love I love that stuff. I just I think it's and it speaks of resilience. It speaks of you know there's trials and tribulations and there's like and then sort of there was a need to survive mm. and you know the community has done that. Um, and here we are having enjoyed two days of wonderful food and community and communion and it's just been it's been. It's been fantastic. I hope this is not my last trip here. Mm. Um, and we'll we'll make it. We'll make we'll make a plan. We'll do, we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do something. You know, and in all of that, you know, I believe there's a hand that you know, a power that leads that's over us. You know, I think many of us human being, beings feel that, and uh, we may express it in different ways, but it's there. And um, can trust in that. Good vibe here. Mm. <laughs> let's get back. To, let's get backed up. Can we have Thanks, one? Of, can, can, we, can we have one of the? Can we have one of those beers that we had last night? Oh yeah. Let's get stuck into it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll. Um, I'll see you. I'll see you shortly. But I'll see you next. We'll pick it up tomorrow with for our Patreon members on the Q and A. Thanks, Johannes. Wonderful. And next week on The Regenerative Journey, my guest is Kim Deans. I caught up with Kim and her husband, Angus, actually, uh, at their farm at Tinga in northern New South Wales near Inbrill. Uh, I did an interview Angus, though he has an amazing story as well. The couple are a real powerhouse in farming and all sorts of other cool things. The garden is amazing. Uh, And their stories of the fire that, um, uh, that hit them a few years ago are incredible. Um, Kim, uh, we have to wait till next next week. But Kim's journey is all about farming biodynamics, uh, on farm finances. Um, she's actually a contributor to uh, in our webinar series as well, uh, which you can go and grab yourself a place on a virtual uh, webinar series. Your regenerative journey. Go to web, uh, our website, charliearnett.com.au to grab your tickets. But next week, our guest Kim Deans on the regenerative journey. This podcast is produced by Reese Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.